Thank you, Mari, for that introduction and congratulations on the talks program. And it's really wonderful to have all of you here on a Sunday morning. I know it's it's a hugely busy week and this is a really, you know, it's a wonderful slot. I, I spoke in this time last year and I do enjoy the Sunday morning conversation. It feels very convivial. And so I hope that there'll be time today for questions. I know you'll have a lot, um, but you know, really this is a tremendous opportunity to have both Klaus and Stanley with me today. And I'd like to begin by just providing a bit of an overview to what the discussion will be about. So, you know, from studio visits to press launches, late night Skype conversations and openings, the relationship between an artist and a gallerist is one that encompasses endless amounts of negotiation, communication and trust. It's a really interesting relationship and to have the opportunity to discuss the interpersonal implications of what it is to create this particular type of partnership, a conversation through time that exists in the best artist and gallery partnerships is a terrific opportunity. And I think, you know, when you walk through Art Basel and you walk through the halls, every single work that you see is the outcome and consequence of a conversation that's been occurring through time. You know, there's a really when preparing for this talk today, and I also did the artist and gallerist talk last year, there's a lot of literature that refers to artist and gallerist collaborations as similar to a marriage. Um, there was a great article actually in Huffington Post where Daniel Grant wrote about the idea of likening artist and gallerist marriages to the you know, introduction through mutual friends, the period of hand-holding, of kind of, you know, of getting to know one another, through to, you know, the partnership, to the agreement, to the signing of the contract, and then not infrequently, sometimes and occasionally, the messy ensuing divorce. And there's something really interesting in the way that the metaphor of the marriage, a kind of social contract that's negotiated on particular terms, is used when describing what it is to be a gallerist and an artist working together. And within that, the responsibilities to manage and think through how the relationship changes through time, um, with the consequence being that if you can't be responsive to that structure, what happens in the end? You know, but having Stanley Whitney here is a tremendous opportunity, and I'm his works in Documenta at the moment across both the Documenta Hala and across Athens are absolutely extraordinary presentations. I'm going to Athens tomorrow, but the Documenta room is one of the highlights of the exhibition, I would argue. Stanley would be known to most of you as one of America's most celebrated painters whose career has exploded in the last five years with his exhibition Dance the Orange at the Studio Museum in Harlem in New York. Several of his paintings, as I mentioned, in Documenta currently. His works have been included in exhibitions like Outside the Lines and Black in Abstraction at the Contemporary Art Museum in Houston, 2014. And I was chatting with him before also about the representation of his work in something like Utopia Station, the 2003 Venice Biennale. Stanley's been exploring the formal properties of colors within ever-shifting grids of multi-hued blocks and all over fields of color-filled gestures and passages since the mid-1970s. His practice is an exponent of the process-based, spatially gridded square when you think about artists like Joseph Albers, Carl Andre, Agnes Martin, and many others. He, his works draw influences from early minimalism, from color field abstraction, from jazz music, and refers back to historical precursors like Titian, Velazquez, and Cezanne. His method of painting is unusual in that each section of color he applies, and I love this, and we were standing in front of his painting at Klaus's space yesterday, informs the next and so on, creating a sequence of unpredictable visual tableau, and we have a series of images that will be playing on rotation today. Alongside his paintings, Whitney Stanley also creates really wonderful etchings and prints, particularly sort of monographs and drawings. And I really love that mix between black and white, the monochromatic and the color field. A recent quote in Hyperallergic, and I just want to put a bit of the social, cultural and political context in place for Stanley, um, read that Stanley's career has unquestionably been affected by race and racism. Being African American, he's been caught in an unenviable no man's land on one side is a systemically racist art establishment, which, when not excluding artists of color, often expects them to make work solely about their racial identity. On the other side is a radical black community with the expectation that black artists engage in a social struggle through their work. Stanley himself wrote in a 2015 issue of Art Forum, so much of my work resembles, so much of my color resembles music, something that is intrinsically difficult to address in language. 
Jazz is misunderstood in the United States, but a friend expressed it best when he said, Charlie Parker came to Stockholm and he liberated the city. I think that's a great quote to come back to later as well with class. Um, he continues to write, we take jazz for granted as an American expression, but the intellect in music is hard to discern. Similarly, African-American art is typically understood as depictions of the body and not the intellect. Even today, it is a fight to be an abstract artist, a fight to be outside of blackness and not in a post-racial way or as in Dubois postulations about race and double consciousness, but almost in a class way, moving beyond demographics. Skin color remains, culture remains. But what does that look like? Being outside of blackness as an artist, not being white, just being human. I think, you know, there's a lot in that today and that we'll get through that further. But within that, there's this really interesting conversation that then occurs with the context in which Klaus is coming from. And Klaus Nordenhacker being the founder of Gallery Nordenhacker, which has galleries in Berlin and Stockholm. The gallery was founded in 1976 in Malmo and presents contemporary art with an international focus and would be known to many of you for presenting works like by artists like Richard Serra, Miroslav Balka, uh, Helen Mira, and Stanley, who had his first show with the gallery in 2012 in the Berlin space. Um, Stan, I love that Klaus has had a gallery almost longer than I've been alive and participated in his first Art Basel in the 1970s um, and has also been a member of the Committee of Art Basel from 2003 to 2012, so had a direct role in really shaping what this Art Basel is today. When I did actually, Klaus is a bit difficult to find content on online, and I know the gallery, but I didn't know Klaus before yesterday or the day before. And so I asked colleagues for their impressions of Klaus. And my wonderful colleague, Sunita Kumar Emmett from Gallery SKE in Bangalore, described Klaus as an, an intellect, intimidating and heroic in equal measure. Um, <laughs> coming from Sunita was a really wonderful um, description and I was, I was equally intimidated <laughs> in e equal measure. But I, what I love is I actually spoke to other people who said that, you know, Klaus really thinks of his gallery as a vessel. He doesn't think of it as a kind of a hierarchy or an institution. He thinks of it as a space in which ideas are proposed over more than four decades. There's been a privileging of the artist and a prioritizing of the artist ahead of the market, ahead of other criteria. And that, and that privileging of that relationship directly, in effect, enables the gallery to sustain a very particular type of program. You know, it's a very streamlined and efficient team across the two cities. It's not bloated. It's not an inflated list of every artist working internationally. And I think this is something that we can go through today because there is something really interesting. Klaus actually sent um, Stanley an email um, before we met. And he, they didn't share that initial email with me, but it was later shared with me. And in that email, it was questioned what I could bring to today's discussion and if I would have any questions. And I have a lot of questions. And I think, you know, really, there was a great thing that, um, that was written by Klaus that I'd love to share with you before we really get into the nuts and bolts of this. And he wrote a text about the gallery business and its fundamental rules and plights for a panel he did in Barcelona recently. And, and this particular passage, it was such a delight to receive it because I thought, oh yeah, we've got this. Um, and it opens up some really interesting ideas that we can explore through this discussion. So I'll hand to Klaus to read his passage. I'm not so used to this, so uh, do you hear me? Yes, you do. I wanted to, um, I was invited to some kind of panel in Barcelona a couple of years ago, and I uh, wanted to define mostly for myself what the work that I had been doing for 30 odd years or, or so what it was about, and, and uh, so I wrote down a few, a few points of my experience of, of uh, running a gallery over that time, and, and I, I came up with, with uh, even for myself, conclusions that I had never thought about when I really, you know, to, to, to work with a gallery or to start a gallery or to run a gallery, th there is no education, yeah? There is no, um, I mean, there are lots of different educations which 
probably would would be good for a future gallerist, but there is no specific education. For myself, I studied law without uh, uh, much success. I didn't, uh, I didn't conclude my law stu uh, st uh, studies. So, and amidst studying, I, I became involved with this gallery, and there we go. Um, anyway, I, I, I will quote myself about the role uh, that a gallery, at least uh, in the beginning of an activity. Anyway, what I wrote was he or, or she, uh, the gallerist, serve, serves as a cleaner, hmm? you clean the gallery, a guard, you have to guard the gallery, an interior architect, you have to plan your, the way that the space is, is uh, built. And in the beginning, you are probably a carpenter because you have to build it yourself in order to get the works to the space. You become a shipping agent, yeah? probably, a, 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 in my case, you tr transport the works in your own car. Uh, um, you become a storage worker because at some point you have to store the work. You have to organize the graphic design for the, for the gallery. You photo, most likely photograph the work yourself. Um, you are, of course, the bookkeeper of your activity. You should be an art historian, and even if you are not, you try to become one. No? Um, you, uh, the metaphor of being a gallerist and a teacher is something that I find very sympa sympathetic, that talking about the art for its qualities as a teacher, I, I always describe myself as a traveling salesman and a school teacher. And, and sometimes you become even a professor. You know? uh, you're a cook because you, you have to arrange uh, parties and dinners. You, and of course, you're a waiter. Uh, you, you run a little restaurant in the beginning. And um, you're a f at times a philosopher. As I said here, at least late at night after the dinner. Um, you're a business strategist, you're an actor, you're very often a psychotherapist, you're a pimp at times, you're a sympathetic drinking companion, and later you're an arrogant bastard. <laughs> you're an interpreter, an arms runner or drug smuggler, that's the way that Hollywood or the film world likes to see the gallery. You're a secretary where the boss most likely is the artist. Uh, and many artists are in co conflict with other artists in the galleries. Yeah. Anyway, that's, that's what I wrote down. And I think there are some aspects there that one tends to forget when you talk about the gallery. You always talk about the exhibitions, and rightly so. But, but the work uh, implies a lot of aspects. So. I think um, there is actually a sentence you missed when you read that, though, Klaus, which is the one where you say that a gallerist is a divorce counselor, 
a lover, in brackets, exceptionally, which I wondered meant on exception or with exception, and a travel agent and a banker. So I think we're going to have to come back to some of those words at the end. But Stanley, given that, um, you know, I suppose something actually that I wanted to, I think it is a great summary actually of, and there's a number of words that I'm sure would strike a code with, chord with both of you to varying degrees in terms of your relationship with one another and your relationships with others um, and the experiences you've had dealing with galleries over the years. And um, something that I really found interesting with you yesterday when we were speaking was that, you know, in the beginning of your career, you were born in Philadelphia, you studied in Kansas, but it was really 20 years before you had a steady representation with a gallery in your practice, unlike artists of today who are seeking representation almost before they've finished their undergraduate studies at college. Um, and if they're not picked up by a, an, by a gallery before they've actually done their graduation exhibition, um, there's a sense of a different kind of career trajectory if there is such a thing. But when you began as an artist, you came out of a particular period of social, cultural, and political change. Um, you were born in a time of turbulence and substantial social, cultural, and cha political change in the United States. You know, really working independently, but also teaching for such a period of time. What was your experience of having a gallery in the beginning and also those early years of your practice? Uh, well, I, uh, Kansas, I, I got out of Kansas, I went to school in Kansas City, uh, Missouri, Kansas Air Institute, in the Midwest, uh, although I was from Philadelphia. Uh, so it so was like, how did I, why would I go to Kansas City? Um, but what's happening at the time uh, in the 60s uh, was the Vietnam War, you know. So the war shaped a lot of people, you know, and when I came out of high school, that was one of the biggest draft years for that war, uh, Vietnam. So, um, and I knew I wanted to be an artist, but I had no idea what that meant and um, how I would achieve that. Uh, but I ended up getting a scholarship to a school in Kansas City, so I went there. Came in New York in 68. And, you know, as an artist, um, well, Klaus describes a lot of things, so our artists are very strange people uh, in terms of how, you know, who we are, what we do, and even our relationship even to business, you know, uh, some artists are better at business than others, depending on where you come from or what class you are. Uh, myself, you know, being Afro-American, coming from a poor community, I had no idea what that meant, you know, or how I would achieve that. So it was one step led to another step, one step at a time. But school kind of shaped me. I came to New York, and then I ended up going to school at, at Yale. Uh, that was like 70. And I like to say people went to jail, and I got to go to Yale. And that's kind of what happened. And once I was at Yale, all, my life totally changed. Before that, I was totally, you know, uh, painting, but just job to job. Uh, thinking about a gallery, wanting a gallery, but not really knowing really what that meant, you know, like what, I, what that really meant. What that, because you're, what you're thinking about as a young artist is like, I give them art to a gallery, they sell it, and then I make the money, and then my life is better. Which is true in one sense, but there's, it's much complicated, more complicated than that. So uh, my early ideas or early people I dealt with when I got out of school. Some people got a gallery right away. Uh, myself, it was harder for people in the 70s to figure out sort of like who I was or what I was. Uh, race always plays a big factor in my life, uh, whether I want to or, or not. You know, it always has and I guess always will. And so the first, uh, I didn't get a gallery right away, which was really kind of shocking. I was like, I don't know why. Uh, but a lot to do, a lot of it has to do with race in the art world, you know, and things really change. Uh, the one thing in the art world that really changed into race was Basquiat. You know, he really kind of like, it was kind of like the Berlin Wall fell down with Basquiat, like that. Um, myself making work that was kind of coming out of uh, color and uh, minimalism, and people had a hard time figuring out sort of, you know, like, where are you coming from? You know, what are you doing? And 
I was much more of a, someone who was much more involved with being in the studio. I was really like a studio person. Where I, and people I grew up with in the 60s and 70s, we kind of thought we had a lot of time to paint. We thought looking at people like Rauschenberg or, say, Barnett Newman or all these art, or Gustin, I knew Gustin pretty well. Uh, you really felt, well, you had, you figure, well, I'll, I'll give it 20 years or 10 years before I show. I wasn't, you didn't think you were going to show right away. The money in the art world, kind of in New York, I can fix the New York art world, kind of came really in the 60s. You know, people sort of, before that, most artists didn't have much money. Or there was a big art community. You could be at the bar, you know, a lot of art bars. You could see de Kooning. You could see, you know, all these people, you know, they were there. Whether you talked to them or not, they were all there. Now, no one's there because the rich artists are kind of gone, you know. Um, so you felt you had more time, you know. We had more time. So I wasn't so upset that, you know, I didn't get a gallery right away, you know, that, like, people who got, people who got galleries out of school in 72. I wasn't that upset by that. Uh, you felt like, you know, maybe 10 years, you, you know, five years, six years, you get a gallery. Well, it didn't sort of work out that way for me. And then you start realizing that really you have to be, you can't, as an artist and gallery, you can't really think about other people. You know, you're on your own. You know, why things happen or like now, why I'm successful now, you know? It's just the way it is. You can't say, well, this should have, it's just time shifts, things shift. Uh, the world changes, um, and I look back at those years where I didn't have a gallery as really good years now, because that, that time allowed me to do anything I wanted in the studio with not being bothered, and uh, now I'm really on solid ground, you know, solid ground. So when I, the first gallery I got was, uh, I dealt with a woman who, Peg Austin, Afro-American, uh, uh, she had a small gallery in her apartment, and I showed with her. And um, that was fine. It, it was kind of like a, an odd thing. I mean, there wasn't much money. The money thing was always an issue with her. She'd pay me a little money, and then there wouldn't be much money, and she would say, well, it's African sculpture. And I'd go, yeah, I'll take the sculpture. Uh, so that's a big thing. The money thing with the artist is more about maintaining, having the freedom to work to your potential. That's what you want as an artist, to work to your potential. So uh, that was my first gallery. Then Jose Ferrer who, a Team, it wasn't Team then, it was, he had a small gallery in Lower East Side. And Jose really did show me for a long time. He really, I have to give him a lot of credit, he really showed me. When everyone else said, I don't know what that guy is doing, he said, I, I'll show you. You know, uh, it's just the kind of personality he is. I'll show you, you know. And so that was really good. Um, and slowly, slowly, uh, I got a better sense of what I wanted from the gallery, you know, and what that is. I think, you know, um, it's hard to figure out that the, the relationship between the artist and the gallery, it's a really special relationship, a delicate relationship. and. Uh, <clears throat> it's um, and sometimes it's, it's a difficult relationship. I mean, I think um, when we were speaking yesterday, Stanley, that it's interesting that idea that you didn't have a commercial gallery immediately, and I think that gives young artists more space if they're not immediately represented to have risk and experimentation and space for failure, which is important as a young artist, as much as achieving a resolved body of work in many ways. Yeah, I think it is, but you know, now it's just difficult because for the young artists now. Um, it's just more expensive, you know? I mean, it's hard for young artists, right? It's hard for anyone, whether a young artist or a young gallerist, because of the economics, you know, uh, um, the space. I mean, New York, when I came uh, downtown, was totally empty. You know, you could walk from, you know, there are a couple of art bars, a couple of places. There was nobody. You could walk from if you uh, you could walk from like 18th Street down to Canal Street, middle of the night, and there'd be nobody on the street. Zero. Uh, rents were cheap. You felt you had the time. You know, you could have a part-time job. You could make your rent in a week. You know, 
those situations are now not the situations in New York anymore. So it's, it's hard. I mean, and if you're going to be a painter, you have to have a big space. You know, you have to uh, forward canvases. You, have to, you need a lot of time. You need a lot of time. As an artist, you need a lot of time around your work. So economics have changed a lot in terms of what, even the kind of art you can see, you know, because of economics, you know. Absolutely. Sort of and I think, you know, there is, the stakes are high. And yeah. it's, people are visible early. Right. Right. And, you know, I think that space of how you do, it takes time. You yeah. know, both of you, something that I love about your partnership is that you, although you'd had a conversation that had been going for much longer since the early 2000s, it wasn't until seven years ago you began working together in a formal capacity and, and that you both bring a level of experience. You know, this is not a conversation today about two young, and a young artist and a young right. gallerist, you know, right. starting together, building a gallery, building their reputations, you know, 30 years of struggle and, you know, kind of highs and lows. This is two people with a, a cumulatively a serious amount of experience um, and understanding um, and precursors and benchmarks for the ways you want relationships to be in this context as much as how you don't want them to be. And I think, Klaus, yeah, I was about to say... Uh, I think, uh, it, I think uh, it was a... Stanley was living in Rome. Stanley and his wife Marina was living in Rome. And I had an American uh, assistant or a schlepper in the gallery who was a young artist. And he kept on talking about this American artist uh, uh, who, who lived in Rome. And, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and one day, I was introduced to Stanley. And, and it was like, uh, I mean, I'd, I had by then seen the work and I'd been trying to, under I was always thinking in terms of music with, with uh, Stanley's work, like a Bach fugue or, or maybe a jazz, uh, one of the more reductive jazz. Um, free jazz people, uh, but um, so suddenly I saw a show at Christine Koenig's uh, gallery in Vienna, and I knew this is, this is, this is it. I think, um, you know, there's a story that Stanley told me yesterday that you met the first time, and he came to Rome and had a chat with you and, uh, or came to Berlin, you met in Rome, but came to Berlin and had a chat about, you know, a kind of early conversation about maybe working together and you said, you know, I'm not really picking up any new artists at this time, I'm focusing on video, not on painting. Um, but then you actually acquired one of his works, which is interesting. So as a collector yourself, you were collecting painting, but as a gallerist, you were thinking something quite different about the gallery. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I always see myself as a dealer and a collector. A collector meaning that I must uh, commit to the art that I am interested in. And committing to the art means, among other things, uh, acquiring works for yourself that you don't want to lose because you want to have them in your in your uh, immediate uh, surroundings. And so I got a painting of, of Stanley, which I still have. And, and um, little by little, this developed. I think it's interesting, you know, do you live with the painting? Yeah, yeah. Or where is it? Yeah, yeah. Is it in your home? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, I'm happy to live in Berlin where there is space enough to, to house a lot of works. I think um, it's interesting, yesterday when I was speaking with Stanley about your collaboration and that you just brought up then that you think that perhaps it's a piece of music, your collaboration mm. with Stanley. I was surprised to hear Bach then, but maybe not entirely <laughs> unsurprised. I'd love to hear what Stanley thinks, what kind of, because um, music is such an important place in your practice. Well, music, well for me, you know, uh, I'm glad he brings up Bach, to tell you the truth, uh, because, you know, great music's great music for me. So, you know, the, mu the, music, th uh, the music thing in terms of my work is, uh, 
there was always music, you know, for me. Uh, music, I think, um, where I grew up, coming out of the community I grew up, it was all the music was the most important thing. Uh, music, I think, and you know, I'll say this in terms of maybe uh, in the Afro American community, I think music sort of saved everybody. It's the music, and so whether you go, you know, if you go to a black church or something like that. I mean, mu mu it's always the music, and they always reinvented the regeneration. So there was the music. So when I went to art school, I had the music, uh, but I didn't know really what the art was, you know. And funny, because the Cezanne show here at, uh, you know, at the Kunst Museum, uh, it was Cezanne who, when I went to a freshman school in Columbus, Ohio, and then went to Kansas City, and there was a small little painting at, at the Columbus Museum uh, Cezanne, and I saw that, and I thought about you know music. I thought about Charlie Parker. I saw that and thought it's like music, because it had such great rhythm to it. So that was probably the first key to me. Like, oh wow, this is I could relate to it in terms of music, in terms of how the rhythm to it. Um, so the the music was always there. Then we're trying to figure out what does that mean in terms of visual. What does that mean in terms of painting? And so that's. That's something I've been working on, still work on. So that's part of it. That's, that's, there's all different. It's like with paintings, not the pieces to the puzzle. That's part of it. Um, when I'm in cloths, it was interesting because, you know, when I'm in cloths, I had I was showing Christine Koning in in um, in Vienna, who I met through David Hammonds, and we did a show together there. Klaus saw it. Uh, I went to Berlin. Uh, it was great meeting Klaus, uh, you know, a real established gallery. I was very eager to want to show with him. And uh, he, it, we, he was very slow about it, you know. He wasn't like, okay, great, let's do a show. Um, but it, he was very slow about it. He, uh, then, he, then I thought, well, maybe it won't happen. Because I was even thinking at that time, I, we were living in Rome, and we had a, uh, Marie and I had a, a son who was eight, and we were thinking, should we go back to the States, or should we move to Berlin? That's what we were thinking. I was thinking that. So I was thinking, I'd go see Klaus, I would go to Berlin, and I would think about whether I would go back, move to Berlin. But what I made the mistake was, is I went to Berlin in the wintertime, and I couldn't <laughs> go from Rome to Berlin. I thought, I can't move. To Berlin, it's too damn cold. <laughs> and I thought, well, it's gray and cold, and Rome is so beautiful. So we went back. We went back to the States, and then um, then Klaus acquired a painting uh, of mine. And then dealing, dealing with Klaus, I think for me, it's been he in a way he moves like he moves. We move very similar in terms of he looks for a sign or he feels things out. And that's the way I move. I look, you know, I look for a sign, or I, f I think about when when's the right time to do this or do that. And so, in Berlin, we had a great conversation because uh, we were sort of the same generation about, you know, about politics and the wall had just come down and what was going on. And that was really something that always stayed with me, in terms of the, uh, in terms of you know how we move. If he comes to my studio, how he looks at things. If he say we do a show, well, when we do a show, it's, he, f he really feels it out. The first time I did a show at his gallery in Berlin, I took work from both uh, my New York studio and my uh, Italian studio. And people always ask, well, what's the difference between my Italian paintings I paint in Italy and the paintings I paint in New York? And uh, usually at that time, the thing they painted in Italy stayed in, in, in Europe, and I never mixed the two together. So we did this first time I did this show at the gallery in Berlin. I brought the New York paintings, some New York paintings, and some Italian paintings. And it, you couldn't tell the difference, which I was surprised, even myself. But then what was interesting, too, with the gallery, is that when we went to hang the work, we had all this work downstairs. We were looking at it, putting it around. I had no idea. Well, well, I put this here, put this there. And Klaus came in and said, put this, this, put this here, put this here, put this here, and we're done. And he was absolutely right, because yeah. it was his space. He knew it really well. And so it was interesting in terms of really how we relate, how we get things done, what gets said, what gets felt out. 
and, was, and that's how I do it in the studio too, you know, like that. So the relationship with an artist in the gallery, it's, it's kind of delicate and it's kind, and it's kind of, it's interesting because it's that and then there's a money factor, you know what I mean, all that. So it's really mixing art and money is, is, is kind of a strange thing, very strange thing. I mean, I, I suppose Klaus, you know, there's something there when you began the gallery in, in 1976 in Malmo when Stanley talks about beginning his practice in New York and moving to New York and the way that there wasn't so much attention and the way that it is amplified and, and heightened in the current kind of moment. And when you began the gallery, what were the things that, you know, when, you, when Stanley says it took a long time for this to eventually happen for the two of you, you know, would it have been something 40 years ago if you'd met Stanley, would you have said yes quicker? Was it a different way that you thought about how you built relationships with artists and established the foundation for the gallery? Well, I came of age about the same time as Stanley, and uh, which was highly political times, even in peaceful Sweden, there was, it was very confrontative. And um, of course, the, a, a Marxist ethos is something which has dominated my uh, grown up years, I mean. Uh, and um, I was, however, n not very interested in, in so-called uh, political art at the time because I thought it was too simplistic, too propagandistic, and I turned to what had been uh, totally banned a couple of years, uh, namely what in German is called konkrete Kunst, or constructivist art, for the first years of my activity. Um, I showed a lot of artists that were uh, involved with, in, uh, particularly in this uh, konkrete Kunst movement, which I don't think there is a, I don't think there is an equivalent word in English, or there isn't, Nobody, I mean, concrete is uh, uh, English. You, in, in America you call it minimalist, which is also not the same thing. It's sort of a reductive, usually, um, usually um, geometric uh, art form. Anyway, at some point I felt that that was a uh, Cul de sac. I mean, I've, I've felt that the ge geometry, and I became very interested in the flow of of uh, um, painting. Yeah, the so I did a lot of shows with the fundamental painters, like um, monochrome artists. I think I showed almost all of the American and European monochrome artists until the gallery turned, uh, began looking like a church of monochrome where, where uh, every, for, for the general public, every show looked the same. Uh, so with the exception of three or four absolute enthusiasts, there were no people coming to our shows. Uh, and that's when postmodernism hit the, the art scene. So, and I moved the gallery to Stockholm and uh, opened up the, uh, I moved into a space which was very generous in the Royal Academy building in Stockholm and I showed a lot of sculpture, which was, uh, um, and that's, yeah. And it's interesting when you think about the way that we collect or build relationships or ourselves are altered. I think it's really important when you work with art and particularly with living artists that you allow yourself to be changed through time and not to be dogmatic or determined in your position or how you think you understand something, but that actually vulnerability to being altered through encounter or through an idea is a profound and important thing to be open to doing when you work with and around the ideas of artists and art. And so, you know, thinking about your gallery and those iterations from a kind of 
concrete formalism in the beginning through a kind of austerity through to, you know, but there's something in your gallery which isn't reactive to fashion. You know, this is, you're not, you know, running a program which is kind of chasing the gestalt. There's been something through what you've done over the years which has been more nuanced, I think. I want to decide what is fashion for me, yes. And I think that's the... Uh, the, uh, a gallerist, I think, can only do what, uh, I mean, you can have different business ideas, but in the end, the business idea uh, has to go along with what you really feel is the art that you like. And if you look at your gallery now, 41 years from when you established the gallery, is it a different gallery? Did you know how... Did you understand at the beginning of that practice as a gallerist about how the gallery would shift through time? I didn't understand anything. I was just fascinated by the, by the, probably by some artist that I got to know and, and uh, fr from a sort of a bourgeois background that the world uh, isn't, uh, isn't necessarily like I experienced it as a child and as a grow, uh, growing up. So um, I was taught a lot by these artist friends and uh, eventually I was offered to be become partner in a gallery and that's, that's where I am. Yeah. And when you, I mean, what is it when you see Stanley's work? What was it in that moment when you acquired that painting from, from Koenig? You know, Stanley said to me that it wasn't the painting he necessarily expected you to acquire, but he remembers what the painting is. Well, if you look at Stanley's painting, you see that it, it, it sits. It sits, and, and it, uh, it has a structure which probably appeals to me coming from that uh, reductive side, but it also allows for, uh, there's an order in the paintings, there is uh, an intensity, there's a very high uh, color level, uh, but in my view, he seems to be able to deal with that in a highly interesting way. I mean, uh, I think it was in a, sh in, a, in a critical article, maybe Roberta Smith, that referred to uh, Mondrian uh, 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 about Stanley's work, which I really hadn't thought about. But, but uh, of course, it, it has the, a grid which is similar to a, Euro to a very basic European, I suppose, um, um, way of structuring a painting. Yeah. And I think, you know, there is, I mean, but what there is in the work is that sort of persistence of an uncertainty that also exists. There's a moment we were speaking yesterday of like, how do you make almost one painting through time, but make different paintings through time? And how do you know when to stop the painting? Like, when does the painting? So it's interesting to think, Stanley, back to you about. You know, when you began your practice as an artist, you know, the work you're making now, what's that? Well, I mean, I, you know, it was just really for me making lots of paintings. I mean, the way it, it, Klaus talks about the gallery, it was the same way with me. I mean, I was in the studio, I just made a lot of paintings. I mean, I just followed the work. Uh, I mean, I looked, I looked at a lot of work. I mean, I came to New York sort of when Barnett Newman was king and, and, and Judd and all that work. and. It's funny because even in the Kunst Museum here, they have this whole room of uh, uh, of early some Frank Stella, some early Frank Stella, uh, with these with some uh, other Frank Stella. And I look at that work. I mean, that's when I came to New York, and I thought they gave a lot of things up. You know, I mean, it's interesting work, but to the color, I didn't want to give up a lot of things maybe that are really European, you know, as opposed to just American. I mean, I really came out of the New York school, but uh, I felt they gave the hand up. Uh, they gave the um, they gave up sort of like things you maybe you'll see in terms of touch, you know, in terms of a color. And so, you know, I, I liked a lot of the color feel. A lot, a lot of the, you know, you really go around and you really look at. I came to New York at the time. You can really see a lot of art. I spent every you know uh, looking at things, and it's funny because. 
having a European gallery. At the time, you know, I wasn't even thinking about Europe. It's like New York, New York, New York. And I didn't even think about going to Europe. It's interesting who did go, you know, to Germany and Europe or, you know, when p things changed in the 80s when you saw more European art and Italian art in New York. And that changed everything. Uh, so those kinds of color fields are kind of minimalist. Uh, you know, there's things I liked about them and things I was critical of. So you, you sort of take what you like and you sort of, you're sort of making your recipe. You know, take what you like and, and re reinvent things. Because with painting, it's sort of like uh, you're always reinventing things. How can you keep it, how can you feed it and keep it alive and add things to it? So with me, even though it's a grid, it's kind of an ancient grid and it's kind of like, it's like breaking the pattern. Because with the, with the color, you break the pattern. There's a pattern, but the color, the color won't behave. You don't, you don't want color to behave. You don't want color to be good. You, you want to be sort of radical and not behave. If color is good, uh, intellectual has an intellect, it's because it doesn't behave. So, um, and as an artist, you kind of learn that early on because as an artist in school, if you do a drawing and add color to it, it's, it's gonna mess the drawing up. You know, you have to re and then reevaluate. So there's all these things I did uh, early on that were just a lot of, you know, we were talking last night about artists, young artists and people throwing art out. You know, I threw a lot of art out. You know what I mean? Uh, people you threw all that out. I said, yeah, I threw all that out. Uh, you know, it's like cleansing yourself, getting rid of things and having rebirth and, and, and developing things. So for me, it really was just trial and error, trial and error. I, I just, tr you know, tried things and work. Uh, and, you know, you have to really be, I think, strongly independent. You have to be really mentally, it's a mental toughness, you know, in terms of being the artist. I think it's a mental toughness in terms of being the dealer, too, and reinventing it. I mean, I think, I think it's just as hard to be a successful dealer as there is to be a successful artist. I think there, it's, it's two separate ends of it. But they're, they're both very difficult positions to take and to develop. You know, uh, they're, they're, there's so many things that have to happen, that have to happen to you. Uh, you can say it's luck, you can say you made your luck, but it, when you come into it, how you come into it, money, time, I mean, there's so many things that have to, have to come together for both practices to work. You know, it's, it, it's kind of, you know, it's really this sort of self-determination and this kind of will, willing things to happen. Resilience, I always yeah. think, is a yeah. crucial word in yeah. the art world. <laughs> and it's an off, you know, the less often spoken of quality or characteristic in a sense. And, and in the email that Klaus sent me and sent you originally, Stanley, but later sent to me, he actually said it would be interesting today to discuss the pleasures of working with an artist whose work you really like in times of success and also in times of less success. And like any marriage, you know, it's not so much in the good times that you learn what you're made of, but it's the tough times. And, you know, perhaps a little bit of unpacking on that class and what you sort of meant by that question. What did I say? <laughs> you said, let's talk about what it's like not only to work together when we're successful, but when we're not so successful. Yeah, I mean, that's, the, that's every, I think every uh, striving gallery's uh, experience to, to work with artists that uh, are less successful. Uh, and on the, I mean, together in this ecosystem, you join uh, forces and uh, eventually, ho uh, hopefully, the, the artist uh, and the gallery has success. And it, it's also something that goes hand in hand. And uh, a couple of years ago, um, Stanley's work wasn't as well known as it is today, obviously. Uh, but of course, once, once, I mean, uh, once you're in the boat, you have to sail it. And you, uh, and you go onto the boat when you when you are convinced that this is uh, going to take you over the ocean, yeah. Mm. And uh, that was pretty uh, obvious, I think, in, in, for me with this work. How do you maintain a relationship with an artist? Over 40 years you've worked 
with a number of artists, and you have a list of 20 artists that you represented well, at the moment. Well, there is usually the seven-year seven itch or seven-year You guys, seven you're on the seven-year itch on this panel today. <laughs> Are we on the seven-year <laughs> We're on the seven-year itch. You've, you've been working together for seven years. Is there anything we need to talk about? <laughs> Not publicly. <laughs> it's always more fun publicly. <laughs> so far, it doesn't seem like uh, that's an issue. But I wanted to ask you, you I know that you were um, uh, friends with, uh, with um, uh, the American artist, for, also from Philadelphia, Gustin. Oh, Gustin, yes. Uh, uh, I, yeah, I, I meant Gustin. I only knew him for a short time. I met him in 66. I was a young student, and he, in a summer program, and he wasn't very, he was not the Gustin we know now. He wasn't, he was sort of considered a second tier mm -hmm. after like an expressionist. Mm -hmm. And I got, the, it, was a early, it was a summer program at Saratoga Springs, 66, summer of 66, and uh, he was living in Woodstock, and they got him to teach. This, uh, and he he liked my work uh, immediately. He was very old school in the sense he would come in and say, you know, he was a, there were a couple of people he liked and everyone else he said forget. And so he liked me, liked my work. And, uh, and it's interesting because I was sort of going, I was trying to figure out how to get into, you know, contemporary work. I mean, it's funny now because at, I look at work now or, that... You know, it's funny about the whole politics of art and what people like now and what you couldn't do then. I mean, I don't, it's like, why couldn't you do it? I don't, it's just you couldn't, you weren't allowed, you know? And like, but who made those rules up? I mean, it was, it's kind of strange, you know? Uh, and so I was trying to get to abstraction and he was going to figuration. Yeah. So we met at a cr crossroads and he would say to me, like, why don't you go paint that car? Why don't you go paint downtown? I was like, why would I do that? I was trying to get to, I was really looking at trying to get away from some kind of made up figuration I was doing. So he would, but the great thing about those, uh, that generation of people is they lived and breathed art. You know, they just lived, I mean, their kids didn't matter, their wives didn't matter, nothing mattered but their art, you know? And, uh, that's probably the bad thing about them, you know what I mean? But the art thing was just like over the top. I mean, it was just like he, they, he was just that generation of people, whether it was him or, you know, uh, Rauschenberg, who I knew, those people just, it was every, the it, art was everything, you know? And so I learned a lot like that from him, you know, in terms of what that was and, um, you know, look, looking at work together, you know what I mean? How a painting's put together, you know? And so that was really uh, a real key to, he got me to New York, you know, from Kansas City. He got me uh, to come to New York. He worked it out so I came to New York. Uh, so he was very important to me that way. I mean, you, um, you keep a very streamlined studio. You don't have a huge amount of assistance. You do the work yourself, even when you're working in New York. And Italy, you do a lot of the work yourself. And so hearing the importance of that relationship with Gustin, but also, you know, there are other relationships you've had throughout your career. And I suppose those relationships with artists are as important as the relationships with gallerists. And you were saying yesterday, you know, Christina was important, Jose, you know, that, but then we worked out that you, you sort of said to me in the beginning, I've shown with about three or four galleries, but then we worked out you'd shown with about 12. You know, because different relationships have different levels of import or presence at different times. You're currently working with Listen as well as working with Nordenhaker. And so, you know, with those relationships, how do you, you know, what are the relationships that have been key? You're married to an extraordinary painter in her own right, Marina Adams. And, um, you know, these conversations, when you speak of that generation who live for art, but at the, you know, at the separation or expense of their families or personal lives, how do you, what do those relationships feel like to you through time with other artists and with galleries? Well, now I'm an older artist. I mean, uh, it's funny, I can't even think, of, I guess I'm a mature artist now. Um, I, you know, you sort of like work those things out. I mean, those other galleries I had were important at the time. You know, like Christine Koning was the first gallery to, to bring me to Basel. Uh, that was a big key, Europe. Um, that's how I got involved with Klaus. Um, 
So all the galleries were, sometimes with artists do you, you know, if you're not growing at the same time, you can outgrow each other, you know? I think that's a big thing. Um, then I think you have to start thinking about what you want from a gallery, it's the kind of space and time you want, and where they give you that, you know, how they, how they, you know, what you want in the studio. I, I, you like, I'm the kind of artist who I do, do all my work myself. I have no assistance. I even wash my brushes out myself. Which when I wash my brushes, I think, why am I doing this? Why don't I hire someone to wash my brushes? But I like my brushes totally clean. I don't think anyone could clean my brushes as clean as I could. Or if they did, I'd watch them. You know, I'd watch <laughs> them. Uh, so little things like that, you know, in the studio. In the studio, uh, no one ever sees me paint. You know, now people, because I have an assistant, assistant, they do see the work unfinished. Used to be no one ever saw the paintings unfinished, except for Marina, uh, my son. Uh, my son, I don't think, you know, never saw me, never seen me paint, you know. Uh, he's like 26, 25. He's never seen me paint, you know. Um, so I, I'm very, pro that's that kind of, I'm delicate that way. And I think you want a, a dealer who knows you're delicate that way. You know, and doesn't push you to do things that you don't want to do. And sometimes you don't know really what's best for you, you know, in terms of an artist, because you're so busy making art that you don't see the world. I mean, you can see how artists, you know, you can see how artists commit suicide in the studio because you're just outside the world sometimes. It's like a delicate time. It's like, you know, it's like a newborn child who doesn't know life or death and what's the difference, you know? Um, so you want a dealer who allows you that room and that space and doesn't push you to places you don't want to be. And sometimes dealers push you places you don't want to be, and then you realize, oh, I don't want to be here, you know what I mean? So you move on. So that relationship of what that is, and so it's, it's, it's like a reading, you know? It's like how you read a painting, how you read a dealer, how you read a situation. So now I have a better sense after you have, you know, it's like the same thing. It's like, you know, you date, you date, you date, and maybe then one day you get married. And uh, now I have a better sense of really, you know, that. I mean, the only time I have a clause, I think it's a really great one. I, I really appreciate him in terms of the space he gives me and how we communicate. Uh, we don't, actually, we don't talk that much, but we do communicate, you know, and that's interesting. You know, and he's very knowledgeable. I mean, think about Klaus, he's so knowledgeable. I mean, last night we were walking around Vienna, and the things he tells me about the history, name of the street was, you know, I mean, it's just so many things. And I think from day one, I, I just found that I was like, wow, you know, this is this is someone who is very bright and and uh, and uh, just really, and it's, and it's a mental game, you know, it's really a mental game. And so now between Klaus and Listen, uh, who I think to uh, how Nicholas put that gallery together, what that is, how much they, you know, appreciate the artist, you know, where the artist is. Uh, even though, you know, there's money, there's money, but that's not it, you know what I mean? So that's, 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 re that's what's real important to me. And so um, that's what I want from a gallery. So you figure out. Some artists want different things, you know, uh, from, you know, from, from gallery. You, know, you figure, that's why there's all different kinds of galleries, all different kinds of artists, you know, what you want. I think it's been a really, it's been a great privilege to talk with both of you the past couple of days leading up to this panel because what I really learned is that you're two people who do more with less, you know, and you're not people who value surplus or verbage or the necessity for more to make more, but you make more with less and what you make you value in a very particular way and that's a really specific and important quality in an art world that has a lot of verbage and a lot of noise. You know, and I think there's a good opportunity here to open up if there's any questions from the audience. Um, does anyone have any, have any questions? Yes, there's a question in the front there. First of all, I would like to um, thanks to the organiz organizers of the conversations because having making our life more rich during these days with these very precious testimonies. Then I would like to, to ask Stanley, when you mentioned at the beginning, you thought that the relationship with the galleries 
will be just easy, you know, sell, buy, etc., and make your life uh, more uh, tranquil. But I really want to please you extend the difficult moments. Just remember two difficult moments that define uh, the bad times between a gallerist and artist. Tell me more about it, but being precise. I, I, we are very curious because we never Dates, see that. Names Everything and times. is live, but it's important to, to see that. It's, it's the drama that we would like to understand to make it more human or understanding. Thank you. If you have any visuals of those moments, that would be great. <laughs> uh, no, Put I them got, up. I said I got rid of those moments. <laughs> any photographs? <laughs> oh, you know, the difficult moments is just uh, misunderstandings, you know, uh, people asking too much of you things you don't want to do, like I meant things you don't want to do. Uh, you know, you know things that maybe you just can't do in that time frame. They think you're just a different kind of artist and they, and they make demands on you that you don't want to go there. Uh, so that, those are the kinds of things that, I, I, that sometimes get in the way of a relationship. Uh, it's like any other, it's not really that different than uh, any other relationship in terms of you think you're going one way, and they're going another way. You think you're on the same, you know, sailing ship sailing here, and they say, no, we're going over here. You thought, well, I thought we were going over here. So it's just things like that. It's just, it's not, it isn't that far from everything that you already know in a, in a relationship, you know, at all in terms of that. Uh, so things like that, that, that's all I can say about it, really. I, I can't get into, you know, it's like, then you sort of get personal about, well, you know, my life, and I'm not going to get real personal about it, but that's, that, I would say it's things like that. Is that, is that okay to say that? You, does that answer your question? I mean... Remember, remember that uh, Stanley is not my boss, and I'm not his boss, yeah? So it's, it's some kind of equal standing in the relationship, which makes it both easier and more difficult at times, yeah? I think that's, you know, it is, this is personal, you know, working with art and artists is personal. You are dealing with complicated issues in terms of the work when an artist wants to make a substantial change with what they've been doing and if they're getting a lot of recognition for what they're currently doing and that's not going to speak to the market in the same way, then, you know, what happens in that relationship? No relationship is ever 50-50 in perpetuity. That's the problem. That's when marriages break out, when someone realizes it's more 90-10, you know. So, you know, how do you, you know, I think there is within your relationship, and this is something that you do bring, which is a level of maturity, which allows you an economy of words, which allows you a preciseness of communication. Yeah, I think so. I, I, that, and like I said, I think also because we, I uh, grew. I mean, even with uh, between Klaus, even with Nicholas, we grew up at a certain time, and we kind of we have understand uh, understanding of the, how we move through the world. Although the world has shifted, the world's changed a great deal uh, in terms of you know I could say in terms of a race, in terms of a lot of things for me, and, and a lot of things are you know different, very very different. But we kind of. You know, and you have to, to you, we all know we have to adjust, you have to adjust. And uh, so we have the understanding. That's a big thing, too, for me, to work with someone who has a sense of who, who I am, you know, and uh, where I come from. I think you said before three words which keep echoing for me, which is color doesn't behave, you know, and... Well, you don't want color to, yeah, you don't want color to behave, you know what I mean? I mean, you're trying to paint, I'm trying to paint things uh, that people w will live with, you know, it's to live with something, not to look at something, to live with something. And so to live with something and all for s something that will, you know, if you change, it changes, you know, it's not like something that just, and color, I, I mean, people sometimes ask me, do you have theories of color? I, I have no theories about color. I just want it to be, the, I just want the magic, you know? It's like what the world wants, I think what the world wants from artists is, is the magic, you know? A lot of other things you can acquire, buy, but the art's something, something, it's not religion either, you know? It's something else, it's in, so that's what I'm trying to do. I'm, I'm trying to get to, you know, the magic. So, the, and color has great depth. You know, you see that, like there was just recently a Rothko show in Pace in New York uh, this fall, and it was just like, you know, no one talked in that space. You know, no one said a word. 
no one could say a word. You know, no one wanted to say a word. No one, you know, no one wanted to even speak. The work wouldn't let people say a word. And that's really, uh, for me, that kind of depth, of, that's kind of something I, I kind of want the work to really have, that kind of, that kind of depth. That's extraordinary, and in the same way, you know, as a phrase, color doesn't behave, you know, it should equally relate to the way that we make assumptions about how we behave with one another, about the expectation that someone will behave in a certain way because of the social contract that exists between individuals, particularly in the high stakes game that is a gallery representing an artist, where there is huge sums of money at stake, there is reputation at stake, there is futures at stake. And so, you know, that idea that we can't, you know, for the gallerist as much as for the artist, how do we maintain an equanimity through time, but how do we also allow that space for change? Because right. we can't right. always behave. Right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, uh, I, I mean, again, this ge there is something about this generation which has, a, I think, like a moral or ethical... Um, moral or ethical issues which um, quite important yeah. um, uh, more important in this generation than in the generation of my children I think. it should be as important in the generation of your children because the ethics of how you run a gallery when you are accountable to people at that level of highly personal exchange and the social contract is you know, and that level of integrity that you've had with your gallery through time, that's the people that things speak of when they speak about you. I'm not saying that one is better than the other, but no. there is a... I think one's better than the other. <laughs> I'll say it. <laughs> I think ethics are better. But um, is there another question from the audience? Can we see anyone else out there? No? Okay. All right. Mr. Whitney, apologies if you've already answered this question. This is just, uh, it's a basic one. I watched Final Portrait uh, a couple of nights ago, Stanley Tucci's movie, and Giacometti had issues finishing or knowing when to finish and get a work out the door. Um, how do you know when a, when a work is just, it's done, okay, I've got to get this out. Uh, how do you know in yourself that it's, it's finished? You know what, I do know that, and uh, I don't know how I know that. <laughs> I just know that because I've been painting a long time. Um, in fact, you know, we were talking about that yesterday at, at, at Klaus's booth of the painting that I did pretty quickly. And, um, you know, you, sometimes you think, well, I, I do this, I do this, I do this, and I spend so much time, and. It's, you think it's real rational and like, you know, like people ask me like, how many, how many days did you work on that? Or what, you know, what's the time frame on that? And with painting, there's no such thing as a time frame for me. Uh, sometimes I can paint a painting in a day. And other times, you know, I, 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 I you know, take weeks. I never paint months, cause I, but I don't know. I, I, I've been painting a long time. It's kind of, like, you know, I think it's kind of like cooking and being a chef, and you can kind of feel it. You know, you're cooking, you kind of feel like, you know, if this is right or this is right. You've done, I've done a long time. I have a sense of that. Uh, so it's really for me been trial and error, trial and error, and now I, uh, I have a sense of it. And it's kind of like, and sometimes I, and sometimes I don't believe it. Actually, the painting that Klaus has in this, I couldn't wait to see it out because I wasn't, I wasn't sure about it at all. I wasn't sure until I saw it out. I'm never sure until I, till they go out the door. And I worry, I worried about that painting. I thought, oh, I don't know. Maybe it's not good. I could do this. I could do that. So I don't really know. It's really, it's really all mental work for me now. And uh, it's, I drive my, Marina crazy. I used to drive her crazy because I would ask her, is it a good painting? And she would say yes. And I would say, and then I'd ask you the next day. And she'd say, yes, I told you. And then I'd ask you the next day. And she'd say, look, I told you. And I, and I, cause I, I, can't, I can't see them. I can make them, but they're very hard for me to see. And so it takes me a long time to see what I do. But I know it's finished, and because uh, the painting won't allow me to touch it. The painting says, don't you come near me. And so I, I uh, but you know, I've learned to make the paintings tell me what to do, and so the paintings tell me, "Don't come near me, don't touch me," and I don't, even if I want to. 
I say don't, I don't touch them. That makes, I mean, you know, it doesn't make sense, but so what? I think it makes perfect sense. <laughs> Do you, I think you think it makes sense too, class. Is there any more questions at all? One more down to get yep, one up there. So speaking of, uh, Mr. Whitney, speaking of knowing and not knowing, you said a couple of times in the beginning that you didn't know what art was before you went to school, but I'm imagining there was something sent you to art school, and I wonder what that something was. Well, you know, in a way, I, I think, you know, you're kind of born an artist. I mean, I, I really was born, and I always drew on everything. I mean, if there's a piece of paper, I just drew on everything. I mean, for me, uh, I could go, get back to kindergarten, I used to draw all the time, and then all of a sudden, first grade, we had to read, and I thought, God, what happened? I, have to, I can't draw anymore. And then I couldn't, and then I felt like, life began again in art school. So between first grade and 12th grade, I spent most of my time looking out the window. Um, so I think I was, you know, always born an artist. I mean, I, I can give you stories when I was, I went to an art school, a little local art school, when I was 10 and I, they, we did a painting a portrait and I, I used every color on my palette and everyone else did sort of care school of black and white painting. And the art teacher liked it uh, I took it to my parents and said, what's that? And I threw it in the closet and never went back. I mean, I didn't know what, so I, I mean, I, I, art always spoke to me and I think artists, painters are kind of born and that's that. And I don't think I had much choice about that. I mean, I was able to luckily, you know, pursue it and just make it happen uh, and just work to work to work at it. Uh, nothing, you know, I, I didn't let anything get in my way uh, to be an artist. And even when I taught, I, I always made sure I never got any student's way, uh, not get in their way. Because I, you know, so I was just born an artist, you know. And luckily it worked out, and, and now uh, people know I'm an artist. <laughs> there was one more question down the front here, just near the camera. Probably a question for Klaus and for Stanley. What, what comes first, a, the, a body of work that the, is then exhibitable or a, or a commission to create a body of work for an exhibition? Just exploring how you both approach that. Maybe Klaus first. I have to answer it. There is no answer. Family. <coughs> well, I mean, for me, I just, I, I'm always making works, but sometimes it, it can work either way. I, I, you know, sometimes you're just ready to have an exhibition, and you just, and sometimes you, just, you're not. You know, it just depends on where you are at the moment in your life, and. Uh, that's what I think. I think it's depends on where I am. Uh, and then, you know, other times I think maybe if, if it's a, you know, well, like Documenta called me and I, you know, that sort of made me, wow, well, I, I, I never thought I'd get that call. And uh, so then you're inspired to make some work, you know, so it can happen all kinds of ways. Maybe perhaps, class, when you're working with the pragmatics and necessity for, um, res streamlining resources in the commercial gallery structure. You know, you've got your dates, you've got your program, you've got your artist locked in, but then something changes for an artist and things are unpredictable. How do you manage in the gallery that shift of, you know, when you have something that you've predetermined but that thing can't deliver? How do you flex with that? You make a group show. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Straight to the stock room. <laughs> It's called the Christmas exhibition. <laughs> See, there's, uh, there's always an answer. <laughs> make a group show and try to find a, a great theme and a great title for it. <laughs> the theme isn't you dropped out. <laughs> um, is there any more questions at all? If yes, one one more there. 
Um, Stanley, you oh. earlier said that color doesn't behave. And then later, just a sentence after that, you said color doesn't have to be good. Why, oh, does, well, be why does behave have to work with good? Uh, why does behave have to be? Well, you know, the thing about the art, making the art, it's, it's full of contradictions. Uh, you know, um, there's lots of contradictions in terms of that, uh, in terms of good, behave. Um, I'm not sure what what good means myself in terms of that. I mean, I you kind of see that in, in artists. I mean, you maybe you look at different artists who are great colorists and get a sense of that, but uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know much, sorry. I mean, I think it is, it's that shift of the words, really, and I think it is, like you said before, it's within the painting. It exists within those moments of, you know, where the painting, where the painting asks you not to touch it anymore, where, the, where you have to, through time, negotiate your own relationship with the process of making because your practice through time has been driven by that process. If you, if you use words like good or bad, that's, that's kind of hard to say what that really means. You know, if I say good or bad or, or even it has not behave, you know, it, it all has, the words have different meanings for different people. So I'm not too sure if I can, if I, if I say it like this in a general sense, if that makes sense. You know, because we're not talking about a particular painting or, or that. I don't even if I can even. It's hard for me to explain a lot of things that I do in terms of the painting. You know. I think for me, the phrase "color doesn't behave" was interesting, both in terms of describing the painting itself and the process, but also the social, cultural, and political implications of you being a colorist when there are certain demands or expectations that are made to represent race or to speak to a larger schematic in terms of your ability to be the kind of painter that you are through time. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, race is such a, it's funny. I mean, politically it's used very well, I mean, what race is, but in my studio, there's no race, you know. Uh, you don't, you know, you don't paint thinking well. I'm a certain race. You, you're, you're, you're just, you're just a painter. You, you're, you know, you're just painting. You know, but then, you, you are, you know, uh, obviously, uh, outside the studio and your life that affects you. And so all those, you bring it. You know, in order to make a good painting, I think I, I would say maybe good art, if I dare say good again, uh, you have to use everything in your power. You know, you have to use everything. You know, you use everything. It's not, you, you, you need everything to make something. You can't leave any, you don't leave anything out, out of the, out. You need to bring everything to it. So that's what I can say. I think the perfect place to finish this discussion is with everything. And, you know, the two of you have been so extraordinarily candid and frank and open and generous in the way that you've spoken today. And, and the words that uh, Sunita used to describe you, Klaus, intellectual, intimidating, heroic, I would apply equally to both of you in equal measure with resilience and integrity and tremendous vision through time. And, and thank you for the more than four decades of work and persistence that you've both put into shaping and defining a space for art and artists. And please give Stanley and Klaus a round of applause for everything they do. More than good.